Thank you. Well, I've seen some friendly faces here and some great presenters, and it's, it's really uh, it's a good topic for folks. Um, I remember when I started law school as a first year law student, I had some questions and I asked somebody, and of course I asked a third year law student, and their response to me was, it depends. And I'm going to be able to answer some of your questions. Some of your questions are going to be, it depends. And then some of them are going to be that there just isn't an answer yet. And I think those are the frustrating ones. But we'll see if we can clear some things up. So starting with kind of some general principles here. Everybody wants to know, well, what, what is the law? What does the law say? Well, let's take a look at a couple. Municipal codes for New York City. It has a bed bug specific provision. Not all of the municipalities have that. And it says expressly including bed bugs in the term of insects. Now, I don't know what happened this morning, but I've always thought that a bed bug is probably an insect. I don't think there's a whole lot of wiggle room there. But, but some people might try to dive into some wiggle room. At any rate, the dwellings have to be maintained free from bed bug infestations. And I heard the question on the 1 o'clock a uh, presentation by Jeff White. Somebody asked, do I have to provide a history? In New York City, the answer is yes. In the city of Cleveland, there's no ordinance requiring it, so the answer is no. Is it a smart thing to do? You bet. So one thing you want to notice with New York City is that on their website, although their ordinance doesn't expressly put the cost on the owner, the landlord, on the New York City website, it says, your landlord is legally required to get rid of bed bugs in your apartment within 30 days. Your landlord must cover the cost of the extermination. Now, you can fight about cause later. I think you've probably heard a lot about difficulties in establishing causation with this type of a pest. But in New York City, that's the law. So let's take a look at another one. The Chicago ordinance says that the tenant has to notify the landlord within five days of something suspicious. And that could be they've seen a bug, they've had a bite, something that makes them think they might have a bed bug problem. The landlord has to inspect within 10 days of that notice in Chicago. The tenant has to cooperate, and this is in the ordinance. And cooperate means that you give access, you do the preparation, you deal with clutter. Anybody see a lot of hoarding these days? Anybody run into some hoarding? Hoarding is a big problem. It complicates the treatment. So it says that you have to do all those things as a tenant. It says that the landlord has to treat, and it actually says that he has to treat or she has to treat such that they eliminate the pest problem. And it also requires them to use a professional pest management company. I can't tell you how many times I've seen this issue come up on my money claim docket. Unopposed case, landlord comes in and they show me a receipt from Bob down the street who bought some cans and he went in and he bombed the unit and that's the treatment. If it's a multi-suite building, what do you think happened? I think he distributed them through the rest of the units, and he's going to have a real problem if a tenant in the future comes up and raises the issue, and that, that document's now public record. That tenant can find that, and they can say, well, gee, you told the magistrate two months ago you had Bob come in and do a bomb. So you're, you're creating a paper trail. It's not specifically helpful to you. It doesn't support you. So what does Cleveland say? Well, Cleveland has an ordinance. It's very general. It doesn't mention bed bugs specifically. It does mention pests, insects. So most municipalities, whether you're in Cleveland, you're in Cuyahoga County, Ohio, wherever, most of them are going to have a similar ordinance talking about residential occupancy standards. And that's what this is. So most of the information that I give you is really related to residential dwellings, not so much to commercial. You know, Mr. White talked about Victoria's Secret and, and um, Macy's and some of the other places that have had problems. I'm not really talking about them. I'm talking about things that you rent as a residence or a dwelling. 
Now, in the city of Cleveland, they can cite both the owner and the occupant or the owner's agent. There can be fines that run with failing to control that insect infestation. So that's called a criminal complaint. You probably want to know person to person, me versus my tenant, me versus my landlord, what happens. Well, Ohio has a statute. Landlord's responsibilities are pretty clear. You have to comply with the codes that materially affect health and safety. Now, I've heard a little bit, not a lot of waggling, but I did hear somebody kind of trying to wiggle around, well, the bugs don't cause disease. They don't transfer disease. But I think there's probably ample evidence there to suggest that the infestation causes disruptions in sleep and other daily activities such that it would become a health issue. So I don't hear a lot of people arguing that it's not a health issue. You have to, as the landlord, put your property in fit and habitable condition. And that means that you have to do whatever is reasonably necessary to maintain the property in that way. And then the last thing that you have to do is deal with the common areas. And I've seen, with a, I've seen a few cases where there have been bed bugs in the common areas of an apartment building or complex. You know, we all love those, those pretty little foyers with the cushy little love seats and, and the, the plush rug, and it looks gorgeous. And I can't help but think back when I was just a young kid, and the church floor was bare and wood. The benches were wood, not upholstered chairs like we have today. And every house had a foyer where you hung your coats and your jackets before you entered the house. Probably a reason for that. Um, and I think we're finding that out today. So those are the landlord's responsibilities. Tenants have some obligations too. So under Ohio law, the tenant has to maintain their premises in a safe and sanitary condition. They have to dispose of their rubbish in a clean, safe, and sanitary manner. And they have to comply with the requirements of applicable codes. And that's where, as I mentioned, the tenant can get cited as the occupant, just as the landlord, owner, manager can. The interesting thing about these responsibilities, I think, is that we don't, at this point, have anything that expressly says, if you have bed bugs, you have to dispose of your personal property in a specific way. Most cities do. Um, I think Chicago and New York are probably the leaders in that. And they require that things be plasticed and, and painted or spray painted or labeled somehow that it has bed bugs. So you have to dispose of something that's contaminated with bed bugs in a very, very specific way in those jurisdictions. We're behind the times in that. We don't do that just yet. So finally, even if you could, could kind of wiggle through the ordinances and, and the, the obligations of landlord and tenant under Ohio law, there's this last thing that doesn't really let you get away, and it's the implied warranty of habitability. There was a case in uh, 2010, Anderson versus Ballard, and it involved conditions of the property, not bed bugs, but conditions that needed repair. And in that particular case, the court said that a residential lease is a contractual relationship. And when you, when you rent a property for a residence, you're renting it to live there. And so along with that contractual relationship is this implied warranty that it's going to be habitable. And then they also said, the court in Anderson said, that this implied warranty is in addition to your statutory obligations. And it also said that any attempt to avoid it or waive it in your lease agreement is inherently unconscionable. Now, unconscionable is a word that you hear in the law a lot. It means it's so unfair that the court's not going to enforce it. So a lot of people want to know about provisions about bed bugs in leases. And I think you should remember, we'll talk about them a little bit more in just a minute, but you should remember this piece of the law 
that if the court finds the provision unconscionable, it's not going to be enforceable and the court's not going to enforce it. You can write up whatever you want in your contract, you can agree to it. Once it comes to enforcing it in a court of law, it may not fly. So everybody wants to know, heard the question a bazillion times today, who pays, who pays, who pays? And generally with this sort of a situation, the owner landlord is going to be obligated to pay for extermination. The tenant will generally have to pay for their own possessions. And that's what I find when I kind of scan the law and the cases that have occurred across the United States. There aren't a lot of case law decisions here in Ohio. There's basically three that I'm aware of. Um, so if you parties can't agree to this, um, then you're going to have to determine this in litigation. And that means you're going to be in front of a court who's going to try and make some decisions based on the information you give them. So the court's going to look at this and we're going to say, courts really favor what's called a mediated agreement. Everybody gets a little bit of what they're looking for, gives up a little bit of what they're looking for, and you generally get better compliance and, and maybe a better respect for the, the dispute resolution if you have an agreed entry, a, a mediated agreement. So the court may send you to mediation to try and work it out. If that doesn't work, then you could try something called summary judgment. And summary judgment is a very technical thing. It's a motion that you're probably going to need some legal help with. And you're probably going to need some experts, some affidavits, and some other things, documentary evidence, those types of things. Hard thing to make, a hard case to make. So if that doesn't work, then you're going to end up in trial. And that trial is going to involve somebody who's a fact finder for you. And that's either going to be a judge, such as Judge Pianca, the, the fellow that I work for, or myself, a magistrate, or it could be a jury, which is a group of your peers hearing the evidence and making a decision about what they think the facts actually were. This is where evidence becomes important. This is where your credibility becomes important. This is where your documents become important. All of those things are now going to mean an awful lot to you. So you have this fact finder, judge, magistrate, or jury. So what are they going to look at? They're going to look at a lot of things, things you've heard about all day today. You're going to look at the extent and location. The location of the infestation may suggest how it was introduced. Um, the history of the infestation, if it's a single or um, a multi-suite building, that sort of thing. The history of the adjacent units, you've heard about you know, multi-suite buildings and 25% have an infestation into an adjacent unit. That's very relevant. And then also, what happened at the tenant's previous unit? Was there an infestation there? Um, it may involve what's going on at the tenant's office. Is there an infestation there? So the fact finder is going to look at all those things. All of those things could tip the scale in your favor or uh, away from you. Some additional factors, timely reporting. And you heard that the sooner it's reported, the lower the infestation is as a general level better it is, cheaper it is, all of those things. Complicating this, you folks are trying to get around this today, that timely report, is to have a good understanding of bed bugs and how they work. I can't remember, it was maybe a year ago I saw a news story, because the news loves this. We've seen that with the schools this week. But the news loves this topic, and so there was this big news story on TV, bed bugs found in the Justice Center, that's where I work. And they get this guy on the street downstairs and the, the reporter's asking him what he thinks and he says, well they're horrible, they jump, those bed bugs jump. Well, you guys heard, they don't jump, they don't. So that misinformation piece is huge. And, and whether you are informed or not can make you more credible, less credible. The next thing that the court's going to look at or the, the fact finder is going to look at is has there been a professional identification? You know, I heard a couple people say, well, we found something in the trap, but it wasn't a bed bug. And that's happened with us too. I've seen them, um, I had one come out of an envelope during a hearing. 
somebody had handed me some evidence. I opened the envelope. I pulled out a piece of paper, and dead bed bug fell out. And uh, I didn't panic. I tend to carry tape. But uh, my bailiff was a little scared, and bam! Well, now I don't have anything to show to say whether it should be treated or not. Um, so, you know, I'm working on, on hopefully calming that, that piece down. Um, the, the other thing I will tell you, too, is, you know, totally supporting what Jeff White said, the panic has to stop. Um, I, the judge did a presentation a couple years ago to judges and magistrates, and he carries with him um, some samples, dead, dead samples, and he starts passing them around. When he pulls them out of his bag, the men at the back of the room jump up and run. And it's like, they're dead, you know, dead. Um, so, so tone down the panic. I've seen it happen where somebody said, in, in court, I'm running a hearing, got a courtroom full of people, like I have an auditorium full of people, and somebody will say, well, my unit's infested with bed bugs. The whole back row jumps up out the door. And it's kind of like, again, you know, let's, let's kind of try to bring some reason to it. So anyway, professional identification is going to be really important here. Um, whether that infestation was professionally treated, as I said, you're just going to be stunned at how many times you're going to hear that it was not professionally treated. Um, also, the testimony of a properly credentialed exterminator could be helpful, and we'll get to this in a minute, but I do have to tell you, I have yet to see a situation where an exterminator, and there are a few of you here, you know who you are, who have been able to testify as to the cause of the infestation. I haven't seen it yet. I've been doing this for 20 years. So I'm not expecting to see that soon. And then finally, that issue of lease provisions. I don't have any to offer you, and I will tell you that at this point, having run the searches in my legal search engines and databases, I have not found a single case in Ohio dealing with a lease provision regarding bed bugs. Now what I can tell you is, because I polled people, I polled magistrates, I polled um, some attorneys and that sort of thing. And what I'm getting back from the attorneys anecdotally is that they do include bed bug provisions, maybe requirements to report in a certain time, um, you know, treatment, preparation requirements, that sort of thing. And when I ask them, have they litigated them? Nobody has. When I ask them if they're being honored, most of them say 80% of the time people will honor the provision that they signed on to in their lease. So that may provide you with some cover, some place to go, some place to spell out obligations, that anecdotal piece. So looking at what the landlord might see and talking to you about the cases that I'm aware of, admissions. So that's the cat bird seat. The tenant's going to admit that they brought the bed bugs there. And that happened in a case called Kenwood Gardens versus Shorter. Tenants admitted that they brought them. Um, the landlord promptly hired a professional exterminator. And in this particular instance, the tenants did not properly prepare the unit for treatment. So the treatment was ineffective. And in this particular instance, the landlord was suing for money damages, the cost of the extermination. And he did win that because the tenants had failed to do as they had agreed to do. And, um, and by the way, too, the tenants had breached this lease. Once the infestation started, they stopped paying rent. Can't do that. You cannot unilaterally stop paying rent in Ohio. You can give the landlord a notice. It's called a 30-day notice to correct the condition. After the 30 days runs and the condition remains, you can start depositing your rent with the clerk of courts. But you cannot just unilaterally say, I'm not going to pay you until you correct this issue. That's a loser for you in eviction court. You don't want to be in that position. 
So at any rate, they had breached the lease by failing to pay rent, and the court actually expressly found that the landlord had not breached the implied warrant of, warranty of habitability. He had hired a professional exterminator, he had acted promptly, he had done everything that he could to address the issue. So that gave that landlord a little bit of cover. So what about a repayment agreement? Well, there's actually an Ohio case on that called Spring Hill versus Pounds. And in that particular instance, the tenants had been in the unit for about two and a half years before the problem occurred. So that's one of those kind of initial criteria, these fact-heavy cases that give you a fact that really suggests that the tenants more than likely were the unfortunate carriers of a hitchhiker that started the infestation. So in this instance, the landlord exterminates he seeks reimbursement from the tenants and they agree to pay and they actually do a written agreement about it. Um, then they decide after a couple payments they're not going to make any more payments. So the landlord sued and he actually won on this. Um, the, the tenants had signed that agreement. There wasn't any economic duress by the landlord in signing this. It was just a simple, you caused it, you should pay for it, yeah, we'll do that. Um, and that was an enforceable agreement here in Ohio. So the last thing is the tenant's failure to mitigate, and that's that cooperation piece. Um, the other piece of this is, and this is actually a case that I heard um, a number of years ago, and the tenant was a young girl. She had rented a, a very nice apartment in the city of Cleveland, and within two months she started finding some bug bites found out they were bed bug bites. She was not happy and she never returned to the unit. She did notify the landlord. The landlord promptly treated. And we actually had the pest control person who did the treatment testify. And they told us that the, the um, infestation was confined to the tenant's bedroom, that there was actually a bookcase next to the tenant's bed where most of the casts and the bugs were found. And they also said there was nothing in the baseboards, the outlets, that sort of thing, kind of suggests it wasn't a long-standing infestation. And um, in this particular instance, the tenant was not very informed about the bed bugs. Even with all of those facts, the expert witness was not able to testify as to causation with any certainty. And so that leaves that fact finder in kind of a, a tough position trying to figure out more likely than not tenant caused it or more likely than not caused by the landlord. In this particular instance, I found that the tenant hadn't proven enough, established enough facts to establish that the landlord was responsible. I also have to say some of her testimony was really not helpful to her. She had not gone back to the unit once she realized it was bed bugs. She hadn't gotten any information. She hadn't educated herself. She threw out a brand new bed when she could have put a bed sack on it. In other words, she extended any economic loss by not being informed by dumping that brand new bed instead of putting a $100 cover on it. She made it worse. She failed to, to mitigate the damage, to lessen the damage. So this was not a successful case for the tenant. And that was Chesterfield versus Macau, and I heard that in 2008, kind of at the beginning of the bed bug issue. The last thing I'll tell you, case specific to things that I've heard and I've seen, um, can you be evicted for not cooperating with an extermination effort? And the answer is yes. The uh, Public Housing Authority here in Cleveland has an integrated pest management system program. And so they're very careful about this. And they brought a case saying that they had tried to get the tenant to clear the unit so that they could exterminate. They had exterminated once. It wasn't effective. They had offered the tenant resources to help clear things out. They showed me photos of the unit, awful lot of clutter, debris, everything on the floor up against the walls. 
um, lots of bags of, of things, and an untidy kitchen, those types of things. Tenant wouldn't agree to let them have access to help them. And so at this point, they tried a couple more times, and then they just said, you know, you're not cooperating. We can't do this. And it's a multi-suite building, so now you're, you're not cooperating. It's impacting all of our other tenants. And so you got to move. And they won that eviction on that basis. So those are the actual cases that I'm aware of here in Ohio. Now there's a couple more tenants issues coming in here, infestation at move-in. And this is an interesting one because it's a jury trial that we had in our court um, in 2013. In this particular instance, the tenants, the hooks, got keys to the unit, they started to move in. And the back story is that this unit had been either foreclosed or abandoned, I'm not sure which. And actually, vagrants had been living in it for a while. And then Fortner, the, the owner of the property, bought it, rehabbed it. And this was, I believe, the first or the second tenant to occupy it as a residence after the rehab. So they get the keys. They have some boxes and things there. They have a friend over. She's sitting on the floor. She has white pants on. Bed bug crawls up on her pants. So the tenants notify the landlord. The landlord actually hires a professional right away. The problem continues, and the tenants vacate after just two months. They could not settle. They went to jury trial. The tenants' evidence was kind of light. They had some medicals for themselves. The wife had been treated because of rashes from the bites. They'd had to remove their pets during the two treatments. And then there was also some testimony about wage losses because the husband worked for an auto company repair shop. When they found out that he had bed bugs, on his clothes and things, he said, don't come to work until that gets corrected. So he lost about a week's worth of wages. The tenants were each suing, as husband and wife, each of them were suing for $80,000. Landlords, take a deep breath. It's not that scary. But they, they're both suing $80,000 each. The jury's verdict was only $5,000. Maybe the tenant's evidence could have been better, maybe not. Some other pieces play into this. Constructive eviction. The tenants didn't move out right away. They waited two months. I'm not sure which way that cuts with their facts. And then the final piece of this, whatever you do, um, be careful how you communicate with people. Uh, the tenants in this particular instance had another issue with water. And they had actually taped their phone conversations with the landlord about the water. And the landlord had straight piped the water service to the house. That means that it's not going through a meter. It's not being billed to anyone. You and I are paying for this guy's water and sewer. And the tenant finds this out when she calls to set up the water and sewer bills into her name. And uh, the landlord, in one of his phone calls, swears at her and says, well, there wouldn't have been a problem if you hadn't called the city. That issue is your credibility. And if you were being dishonest on the water, then you may have been dishonest in some other things. So you want to be careful about that, that credibility piece. But it was an interesting case, and it did result in a $5,000 judgment. Um, as far as the admissions, you would love the landlord to admit that there were bed bugs there. Nobody's ever going to admit it. There is a stigma attached. I mean, witness all the people jumping up and running when the samples come out. Um, but the, the issue with it really tends to be, is it a bad enough infestation that the tenant actually leaves the unit, that the infestation deprives the tenant of the beneficial use of the property? And that's what the court is going to look at with those situations. So not a lot of answers for you here. What do you do to protect yourself? And I think you have to remember it's a two-way street. You have to be educated. You have to be informed, whether you're the landlord or the tenant. 
There are a number of cities that have ordinances now that say when there is um, a bed bug issue, you have to provide a history, like New York City. There are other places, Arizona requires that when you rent the property as a residential rental, you, the landlord, have to provide a brochure to the tenant about bed bugs, whether you've had them or not. You just have to start that education piece. They're trying to get ahead of this, this rock that's rolling downhill on us. Inspections are another opportunity to kind of protect yourself. Um, I think you've heard a lot about how to do a good inspection and keep good records, and, and that's gonna go just such a long way for you. Remember, these cases are very fact heavy. And so if you have a document that you can put forward, it was inspected by Terminex on this date, this is what he found. You don't have to rely on your memory. You have something that's much more concrete, much more credible, and that's a good thing. And then agreements and addendums. Right now, there's no case law that I'm aware of on them. There is that anecdotal piece that they're being honored by the parties most of the time. And so that's another place to look for just beginning to spell out your obligations. Again, that is a piece of education. That provision is an educational component of your relationship as a landlord and tenant. And then a pest management program. The people who have those, you know, some of the bigger apartment buildings, the housing authority, that sort of thing, they'll get challenges on, on the condition, but they generally have enough documents, they have a program, you sign in here, the pest guy comes every two weeks, treats the areas and inspects, if, inspects and treats if necessary, let's put it that way. And, and so those are things that you can really do to begin to protect yourself and, and to make things clear between the parties. I know you've had a ton of resources today. There are a number of very good resources, not the least of which is the Cuyahoga County bed bug site, the health site. New York City has a number of good pieces of information, and um, Utah actually also. I was impressed with their site.